Hey guys, welcome to the video on how to make your AI smarter in NHL 20. The way that we do that is by tweaking our strategies so that the AIs do what we want them to do. You may be thinking to yourself, why should I just use this random guy's strategies on YouTube? How is that going to help me? I'm not just some random guy. I make YouTube videos helping people become better at NHL 20. And I've played against some of the best players over the past few years. Josh Fearless, Young Gren. You may have seen them in the Canadian Regional Finals of the NHL Gaming World Championship last year. At the hands of Josh, I was given a heartbreaking two games to one defeat. I beat Gren in a game of either Online Seasons or Hut Champs last year. I played against Odie two years ago who finished in second place of the Snyder Cup. He uh, gave me a bit of a spanking though. And then finally, most recently, I've played against Nuge in NHL 20. And he was in the US Regionals Finals of the NHL Gaming World Championship. And that turned into a victory using these very strategies. And that's my case on why you should use my strategies. So now let's get into my strategies. I'm going to explain why I chose each setting. If you want to know what all these different strategies do, I have a separate video for that that you can check out. The last thing that I want to mention before I go into this is the only way that these strategies work is if you buy into them. Offensively, these strategies are all about your quick breakouts, your long stretch passes, setting up behind the net for creative plays. Defensively, it's all about stopping your opponent from entering your zone, keeping your opponent to the outside in your zone, and stopping them from taking any high percentage shot. If that's not how you play, then either these strategies won't work for you, or you're going to have to adjust. Starting off with the four check, I have the one two two passive. The reason why I chose the one two two passive is because I don't want my defensemen getting in on the four check. I want to focus on my players taking away the passes. That way, it'll stop my opponent from breaking out, and then I can focus with the one guy on trying to press hard to make him make a mistake. The 1-3-1 one, one in the neutral zone, I sometimes use this interchangeably with the 1-4, depending on the opponent that I'm playing against. Both of these strategies make it really hard for your opponent to get into your zone. You kind of set up a wall along the blue line where you're ready to make a defensive play as your opponent is trying to cross the line. The difference between these two are really just based on... Uh, how often your opponent gets breakaways or if he's trying to mostly go for breakaways. The 1-3-1 one, one allows that one person to be behind the three players just to prevent those breakaways. So the 1-4 is better against the AI, for instance. They're not going to be trying to force a lot of breakaways. They're not going to be cherry picking behind your players. And it'll add an extra person along the line to make it harder for your opponent to enter. Just make sure that when you do have these setups in the neutral zone, that you're still trying to pressure the opponent and actually try to take the puck away from them rather than just sit back and not do anything. You can do that against the AIs. I'm sure they don't care, but it's, it's frowned upon to do that online. The trap four check slider. This slider affects which of these two strategies your players are more likely to do. And I have it set to four check. I don't want them running all the way back into the neutral zone to set up whenever the opponent gets the puck. No, I want them to four check more often than setting up in the neutral zone. And by doing so, we still have some pressure on the opponent. We're still trying to take away the passing lanes. There's just action going on. Don't live a boring life where you're just sitting there waiting for the opponent to come to you. Offensive pressure, how my AIs act in the offensive zone or just when we have the puck. This one's the only strategy where I'm not 100% set on. I have it set to aggressive because I want my D-men coming up with me on the plays, taking shots, be a part of my cycling game, but at the same time, I don't want them in too deep because any kind of turnovers happen, the opponent's going the other way, I don't want to be down a man. These next two are really important because they make up my defensive game. I have contain puck. Players will stay between the puck and the net. So this is how my players act on defense. When they're between the puck and the net, they're ready to block a shot. That means my goalie is seeing less shots come at him, less chances to score, and definitely lower chances for any kind of garbage to be going in. And then what collapsing does is it keeps my players in front of the net. 
they're not going to be covering the defenseman at the point for any kind of point shots or D2D one-timers. And that's a huge weakness when it comes to playing defense against some of the best players in the game. Because then they'll know to pass it back to the defenseman and take shots with them. Just take shots with them all day long until something gets by me. And so what happens at that point is you have to switch your strategy to tight point. If you have anybody taking a lot of shots with their defenseman, you switch to tight point so that each of your players covers their man. When they do that, they'll have a much harder time passing it back to the defenseman because you're ready to intercept it. Collapsing is still the go-to from the start, however, because we want to be blocking shots. The penalty kill, the passive box, it's pretty much just the penalty kill version of my defensive strategy collapsing. Passive box is the best strategy just because it keeps my players in front of the goalie in a tight box like it says. The other penalty kill strategies, my players are just too spread out apart. It makes it really easy for the opponent to just get a one-timer in front of the net. My power play, I like overload because I miss overload. My other strategies, as you're going to see later, I go behind the net and overload is going to bring me back to a few years ago where my players are setting up for those one timers. The other strategies, again, my players are just going to be spaced out a little bit too far apart and those one timers, they're going to be shooting them from much further away. So we don't want that. This slider is always going to be on zero. No doubt about that. We always want to be carrying the puck in. Never dump the puck. Control breakout. When I have the puck for a while, I want my forwards all the way up by the opponent's blue line. This will mean that when I get the puck to them, they are ready to enter the zone. Now that makes a lot of sense if you're starting from behind the net like it says, but many cases when you're in the neutral zone and there's a turnover, three high makes your players go straight up as soon as it happens. So that's why entering the zone is much easier with this strategy. Power play breakout, it's much like the power play carry dump slider. We wanna carry the puck in. So your players are going to set up with that in mind, but be ready for a pass if necessary. Quick breakout is one that is very important to me that I've been changing since uh, the past few years. I used to go leave zone early because it, it generates a lot of breakaways. And if you want to do that, go for it. That's, that's the one. But close support means that there's always going to be someone with me when there's going to be a turnover in my zone. Many times what ends up happening when uh, there's a turnover, especially with leave zone early, is your players will just go straight up because they know you have the puck. But what if you have the puck, you take the puck away, and you're just in a bad spot? It's just going to lead to another turnover the other way. And when that happens, your players are nowhere to be found. That's why close support very important. You need that player there just in case everyone else can just do whatever they want. Three on three offense, also important, except for the part where it hardly ever happens. But if you play a lot of 3v3 OT, you'll know that your players are just super aggressive and it's just a breakaway fest. If you leave it on passive, well, you're going to you're gonna be stopping a lot of that from happening. Sure, you may not generate as many chances offensively, but I think it's defense first. Don't play the game where uh, you're both generating high percentage shots one after the other. You want to protect yourself first and then have any kind of opportunity to score. Now let's go through all of my different lines, the offensive lines and the defensive lines. These strategies are all the same because I value consistency. I want my players doing the same thing every time just so that there are no surprises. Behind the net, I started this one last year because it generates more creativity. When you're using overload or crash the net, your opponent's gonna always expect players in front of the net and then they just stand there, nothing really ever happens. You kind of force a lot of passes and sure, they may be in great position for overload, for instance, for one timers, they may be in great positions to deflect shots with crash the net, but they can still do that with behind the net, actually mostly one timers because your movement, your positioning affects the AI's positioning. If you're the one that's behind the net, then your AI's won't follow you there. They're gonna set up in front of the net for the one timer. What behind the net also allows you to do is get those really sharp angle one timers where your player kind of looks like he's behind the net a little bit to the side. Those are really hard to stop because the opponent's defensemen, they don't really cover it that well. And so that's why I go behind the net. 
Carry dump. We talked about this on the power play, but never dump the puck in. Carrying the puck is so much better. If you're really struggling to get into the zone, maybe you can try dumping the puck in. Make sure to change the slider before you do so, just so that your players are ready to rush in and try to get the puck. And this will also prevent some offsides. Not all of them. In fact, probably not even most of them, just based on NHL 19 and NHL 20 AIs. But it will definitely prevent some. The cycle shoot strategy is about my forwards. I want them to be in great position to shoot the puck. When it's set to cycle, they're a bit further spaced out, but when it's set to shoot, they're closer to the net. Energy and efficiency. I have this set to 10 because I want my little AIs trying as hard as they possibly could. That means on every play, they're giving it their all. Defensively, that means you have a ton of pressure, really aggressive forechecking, even if it's set to passive, that's not the point. But they're just going to be moving around a lot. Same idea, offensively, they're going to be moving around a lot, trying to get into better positions. Sometimes they may get hung up on the opponent's AI, but hopefully you can forgive them and they can still get the puck and be in a good position to get you a goal. The other thing that's really, really, really important about my strategies is to have blocks set to 10. It goes in tandem with the collapsing and contain the puck strategies. Why have these strategies if you're not going to block any shots? In that case, you're just screening the goalie and giving your opponent an easier chance to score. Have it set to 10 and your AIs will try to block absolutely everything. They may not be in position to block everything, but when they are, they will still try to do so. Finally, in my defensive pairing, this one's pretty important too. The hold line pinch. I have this set to zero because I don't want my AIs unnecessarily going up and trying to make a defensive play in the offensive zone. Again, we want our defensemen back so that there's no odd man rushes, there's no breakaways. And this strategy will try to prevent plays like that from happening. Cycle shoot basically says, do you want your defensemen along the boards or do you want them toward the slot when you have the puck and you're cycling around? I have it set to zero. That means I can pass it along the boards easier. If you take a lot of DOD one timers, then you probably prefer this to be at 10, but I haven't really been taking those in recent years. I'd rather try to get it back to the forwards for a one-timer or go in with my defenseman and take a shot in the slot. So those are the strategies that I use to make my AI smarter. Feel free to check out some of my other videos so that you can become better at NHL 20. If you guys have any questions related to these strategies or related to anything, really, let me know in the comments below and I would be happy to answer them. And don't forget to like and subscribe. My girlfriend said every YouTuber says that, so I had to say it, but I really don't care. You're welcome to do whatever you like.